Well, hello again. Finally, we got a break in the rain from Tropical Storm Barry down there in Louisiana in the Gulf Coast. And uh, it's been raining for days and days, but no, nothing heavy, you know, just a good, solid, steady rain, which is, we needed it anyway. Things were really getting dry, and I like the fact that the temperature went down quite a bit. However, it left me with a lot of stuff to weed eat, and I got more grass to mow. <laughs> This has been one year of nothing but mowing. Anyway, it enabled me to open the garage door. Now that I have the garage door open, we're going to do a little bit of work. We're going to do some work on the carburetor. I hope to finish that up today, but we're going to go ahead and uh, work on our splash shield I had to take out. This side here is in pretty good shape. It just needs another good cleaning and uh, scrubbing, and uh, I'll chip off all the loose old, uh, you know, sound proofing, they called it. And I'll go ahead and shoot it again with... Uh, We'll shoot it with some undercoating and a little bit of black paint. No, we'll just put the black paint on first. Then we'll shoot it with some undercoating, but we'll get to that in a second. Or we'll get to that probably tomorrow, because I'm gonna what I do here today is gonna have to sit all all night. And what we're gonna do is just take this wire brush and this wire brush. I'm just gonna wire brush everything I can, wire brush it all loose, as much rust as I can. And then I'm just gonna take this rust treatment uh, by Permatex and spray it on real good. And hopefully when I come out tomorrow, all the rusted areas will be black. Yeah, the rust will have been uh, reformed into that. Then we'll go ahead and give her a, a good coat of uh, primer on the inside. And that'll be about it, I guess. I'm not going to go crazy on it. I just want to make sure it's well covered uh, on the back so it doesn't rust right away. Well, that's about the best I can do on both sides. I mean, I really gave it the old one-two. It doesn't look like it, but it has really been loosened up a lot. All the rust I could find, and I may go over it one more time after I blow off this uh, this rust. Now, I'm not going to use my can of air this time to blow the rust off. Some of you guys, you know, you went practically ballistic last time about using a can of air. So, what I've done is I put a shutoff valve on my air tank. Oh, Gary, a good subscriber, Gary, you know, you do, okay, I keep mine pumped up and all that stuff. Okay, fine, now I keep mine pumped up just because of what you said. So here we are. Of course, it's not plugged in right now. I just got the tank, what the air was in the tank. So how's that make everybody feel better, huh? <laughs> All right, now we'll give her a good wipe down with alcohol. I'm just going to really saturate this rag and throw on the old rubber glove here and just give it a really good wipe down. That should take care of any of the surface rust that's left. And then uh, we'll let that dry out before we spray it. The alcohol has cleaned up the other side pretty good, but before we uh, turn it over and actually spray it with the de-ruster or the rust reformer, I've got to bang this out right here. This is where the, uh, the the fender comes down and meets the underside of the car. This has been bottomed out several times, so this is going to have to be banged out. It's just got to conform on down here. And I'm going to do that with my ball peen hammer, so we'll see what happens here. That's about the best that's going to get. It conforms now all the way down as much as I can. There's a real bad crease right in here where it's been squeezed together and there's almost a ridge, but it'll have to stay that way. And right now I need, well, I think once I get it all sprayed with that rust reformer and then put the uh, paint on and then the undercoating over the top, I think it'll be okay. Well, let's flip it over and start spraying. We are ready. All the alcohol is dry. Now in case some of you have forgotten, uh, they say wipe off all the loose rust, which is what I have uh, done. Then they say spray it two to three light coats, waiting no more than two minutes between coats, and then let it sit for 24 hours. So, and of course you have to shake this up really good, which I have. So let's go ahead and give her, look at that, she's already turning black there. Isn't that cool? It says it, it converts it on contact. Well, we're going to find out. All right, here goes the third coat. looking pretty good already. I don't know how black it's going to turn. It should have turned. Of course, I guess it has to wait all night and work. I don't know. But either way, it's still going to get the uh, primer, the, uh, you know, the uh, Rust-Oleum primer put on it. Well, hello again. It is the next day and we're going to check out our fender and see how it after that spool. That looks really good. Look at that. That stuff did a pretty good job. Oh, yeah, man, that's 
that did a really good job coated it real good now this was this little spot right here I'm not sure about this that must be some kind of undercoating or not undercoating or primer they had put on there but the rusty area boy it just took care of it good not bad not bad stuff follow the instructions just like it just like it said what I've decided to do this can of really rotten stinking rust-oleum gray stupid primer this is really bad stuff but I still have some of it left in the can and I hate to waste it so it'll be on the inside of the fender uh, splash shield it'll be, you won't even see it so I figure what the heck I'll just go ahead and spray it and not worry about it as long if it does its job as far as helping to prevent rust it'll be okay you know and no one will see it no one will see it anyway it's up underneath the fender well but at least it's away from the uh, the road water and mud and crap so I'm just going to use this entire can up as much as I can, then we'll move over to this here, which really is not a whole lot better. rust -oleum, that, that the black primer really does suck. Alright, let's get this other part covered first, I guess. It's really rough textured paint. It's almost like sandpaper, which is not the way it should be. Not at all. All right, that's done. It still has to dry, but I was lucky enough I was able to use the entire can. Now I don't have to worry about that, that can anymore, but it came in useful in the end. I put a triple coating down here in the uh, rusted area. I'm going to do one more thing before I flip it over. I'm going to take some undercoating. I'm going to spray down here where the, uh, this is where, this is at the bottom part of the fender where, it, you know, it's, it's closer to the road. So I'm going to go ahead and put a lot of undercoating through here, give it a good shot. The rest of it won't need it. Uh, it's up high on the inside of the car. So right now we'll just let it, just kind of let it rest. As soon as I get done with that inner uh, splash shield and the carburetor, which I hope to finish up in the next day or two, all of it, we're going to be moving on to these calipers, or this caliper. It's a two-piece caliper. I'm going to show you how to remove I'm going to remove that flex line for one thing, and then I'm going to show you how to remove the pistons. And I don't, these things, they look fairly new. I don't know, they're really in great shape, but still, I want to, I want to remove them. I don't know, you know, I don't know what is up inside there. These pistons have to be smooth. They can't be all pitted and everything. If it turns out, once I remove the pistons, if it turns out that they're, you know, on either side, that's all pitted up in there. I'm going to have to just order a rebuilt caliber and go with it that way. It'll be expensive, but sometimes when you, uh, there's, there's no need to hone it all out. By the time I buy all the stuff and the equipment to hone it all out and get it just right and buy the new piston, uh, I would probably have to have new pistons because the piston, I mean, it would cost the same as buying a rebuilt one. So maybe, maybe in the end, the only thing we're going to salvage out of this whole thing is the good uh, brand new brake pads. <laughs> we'll find out. And of course, I still have the coil spring that needs to be wire brushed real good. And once I get done, I'm going to go ahead and spray it with this also. And then uh, give it a coating of, uh, I don't know what I'll coat it with. Maybe it's just some flat black. I don't know. We'll worry about that when the time comes. But right now, I need to get the dirt and the rust and the grime and the crap off. That's the last item that needs to be cleaned and painted. In the last video, we left off, uh, you know, without determining whether or not this piece right here can be replaced by this piece right here, along with this spacer. I don't know. I may have to forego the spacer. I'm not sure. We're going to find out. As a matter of fact, this may not work at all. The shaft here might not be long enough. Anyway, it came off this old carburetor, so let's find out. Well, wouldn't you know it? The old uh, automatic choke housing is in the way. I've been calling this the uh, the uh, choke, but actually it's an automatic choke. Now, what is it? What is an automatic choke? Well, it automatically, on you know, with the coil winding one way and and, and and unwinding the other, it automatically moves your butterfly for you. Before the automatic choke came along, it was done with a long cable uh, that went all the way back, and there was a lever underneath the dash of the car that you pulled in or pushed out. And uh, the cable was connected to a mechanism up here, which operated your butterfly manually. 
Then they came out with this really cool one, which was the automatic choke. Well, this, the whole thing is going to have to come back off again. Bummer, huh? Well, she's going to work like a charm. She's all back on. Look at here. Now, these, this, this is the one we wanted to line up. This hole right here. We wanted to line up with this hole down here in this one. And guess what? They both, they're now nice and even. They're lined up perfectly. This edge and that edge. So, what we need to do now is get this in. Now, I was going to put this in from the front to the rear, but I'm not. It's too hard to get those clips off. We're going to put it in this way from the rear to the front, just like everything else. And then we'll put our E-clips on and move on to something else. Well, there we go. The little rod is in and it works great. See, yeah, boy, it works great. Now, uh, I did take a little bit of grease and put it in the holes right here and uh, on the shaft, actually on the top and the shaft on the bottom. A little bit of grease there will help it move a lot better. Of course, some people say, well, you know, put grease on a carburetor. Oh, yeah, is that right? Where does it say that? <laughs> it doesn't. Anyway, uh, what we're going to do now is this is right now, the reason this is springing back is because it's hooked to the uh, thermostat inside this uh, choke cover. So what happens is in the morning, you know, there again, your carburetor is wide open. You step on the gas pedal and it releases and it goes like that. I think it needs to go a little bit, a little bit further closed. So I think what I'll do is I'll adjust it just a little bit more. See if I can't get it to close a little bit further. Let's see. Yeah, not, not really far enough. Let me play around with it a little bit. I have removed the uh, two screws that hold the butterfly in. And uh, we've got to have some clearance on this side. That's all there is to it. It's just way too tight. This one here has got plenty of room. But this one here, we're going to have to take that butterfly out of there. And get it cleaned up a little bit. And then... Uh, probably just file down this edge here. I don't know why it would be rubbing right there. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But let's see how it works without the butterfly in there. Well, that was the problem. The butterfly has been dragging against the housing or the base of the top of the, uh, the carburetor because when we push down on this baby here, see, she pops right back. No problem. The the way it's supposed to. So... I don't know. There might be just a lot of crud build up on there. It's definitely going to get cleaned up one way or the other. We're going to have that thing clearance. I want that thing to flip back. And this little booger right here, I may have to wind up taking that apart and cleaning it up. It's been cleaned pretty good, but you know, you never know that when you're dealing with uh, plastic, all kind of weird things happen. First thing I'm going to do is take a little lacquer thinner where I pour it in this top over here. We're going to loosen all that crap that's on there. Get as much of it loose as we can before we uh, spray it with carburetor cleaner. It'll save on the carburetor cleaner. Something I thought was interesting when I started cleaning this uh, red uh, sort of transmission oil color stuff began to appear underneath the dirt. For those, it's, you know, kind of a kind of a maroonish kind of color, you know. <laughs> Yeah, for those of you who don't know who, uh, what that is, that was lead. Lead gas. You know, we used to, our gas we used for this car, and for many, many years, it contained lead. And, uh, of course, they're now lead-free gasoline. Everything's white gas. And uh, my dad used to, once in a while, put amical white gas in his car. He always thought that was, he always thought that was cool. Makes it, and, of course, we used white gas, the amical white gas, for all the Coleman stoves that we used to take camping, and and lanterns and things like that. It was kind of a special gas. Not, not too many people I know actually used it because it was pretty expensive even back then. The next thing I think I should do is remove this rod and give it a good shining and a good cleaning. It's got a lot of crud on it, built up over the years. I want it to really move a lot smoother than it is right now in these two holes. So in order to do that, we'll have to take our clip back off once again. <laughs> but that's okay, piece of cake. Rotate this thing around so it's straight up and down, and then that little tab you see there on that plastic will, will line up with these holes, and, and this thing will slip right out. In order to get this plastic thing to line up with these slots in order to remove it, you can't, you can't rotate this thing upward like this. You have to rotate it all the way down as far as it'll go and remove it that way. 
The plan is to take some uh, 800 grit sandpaper, you know, silicon carbide. It's really, really fine stuff. And I'm going to shine this thing up completely. Get any bumps, any, any, you know, crud or anything like that off of there. Then we'll take this brass brush I have right here, and I'm going to wire brush gently the plastic thing, top and bottom, right around where it goes through this hole, that top hole there. We'll be doing it right, right in that area there, all the way around, and I'll probably put a touch of grease in there too. I do believe that's got it, and this has been wire brushed very, very clean all the way around. Let's see if we can get it back together without breaking something. I'm also going to make sure I clean out these holes here and here where the shaft goes through. And we will do that by simply rolling up another piece of 800 grit and fitting it up in there so it's nice and snug and just ream it out, both holes. Well, she's working real good now. Check that out, huh? Okay, that's done, but what do we do about the butterfly? Hmm. All right, she's in pretty good shape. Uh, it works a whole lot better now if I take this lever right here. I went ahead and set it a little bit closer to where it would close a lot, a lot closer. And the way you do that is with this screw right here. It was screwed all the way down, which kept this thing open uh, a little bit further than I wanted it to be open, about like that. But once I backed it out, I got it about, you know, I can go either way. I can go back the other way and I can tighten it back down if I want, but I kind of like it right about there. That looks about right. Some people like them completely closed, but, and I can still do that. Anyway, uh, I went to all the trouble to get a heat shield for this uh, automatic choke here. Where did I do with it? Okay, this this was a heat shield that went on this uh, thing. These two these two holes on the side here. One the smaller one on the bottom fit over that nub sticking out, and the other one had a screw through it. And it went on like so, and it came around, and it was supposed to be screwed right here. But unfortunately, this new style uh, electric choke won't allow that to happen because this mess right here is in the way, it's sticking out too far. Okay, it just won't. They won't allow it to go over it. And even if it did, I wouldn't be able to hook up the wire. And if you'll take a look at the older choke, it had a flat back on it instead of this thing sticking out, and it could go. It could go flat against it like that with no problem at all. But not any, not not anymore. I can't, I can't, I can't do that. So the heat shield will have to be dispensed with. Actually, I've never seen one with the heat shield on it anyway. I was surprised to see that. And uh, so now what we're going to do? Uh, we've only got a couple more things to do. I'm going to go ahead and screw in these two, uh, the air and fuel mixture screws in the front, and let me set that up. Now, uh, before you screw these things in, I gave these a very good cleaning here. And the tip, if you have one like this that has ridges dug into it all the way around the point where someone has tightened it up so tight that it, where it, when it bottomed out it put ridges all the way around it you need to get rid of them and get some new ones. Years ago that wasn't so easy yeah of course if you went to a junkyard you could pick them up a dime a dozen but not anymore but you can order these now on the internet from Mike's uh, carburetor I'm pretty sure he's got them so what we're going to do is screw these in and I'll show you where they go. Let me get the flashlight here. One goes in the bottom hole. Right down in there, that bottom hole. I don't know if you can see that brass. Let me back it up here a little bit. Anyway, one goes in that bottom hole. And the other one goes in the bottom hole over, over here. So I'm going to give them a quick spray with the carburetor cleaner to make sure everything's nice and clear. And then I'm just going to go ahead and screw them all the way down in until they bottom out, nice and gentle bottom out. I'm not going to torque them down. And once they bottom out, then I'm going to unscrew them two and a half turns. Normally, I found that if you, uh, you know, two and a half turns is a pretty good preset. And I found in the past that I always have to make a final adjustment after the car is running. So depending on the carburetor, sometimes I had to screw them in. 
sometimes I had to bring them out a little bit, you know, back and forth. But you don't do one. You do one until you know, the idle starts screwing up, and then you bring it back in. Then you bring up, bring back the other one, or screw it in until the idle starts screwing up. And then you bring it back in and bring it back in, you know, back the, other, the opposite direction until you get them really balanced either way. It's a touchy feely thing, you know. But the main thing I want to point out is if, if they got ridges and digs and, and marks around there, around the pointed end, forget it. They're no good. Get some new ones. All right. Well, now, now I'm only using my thumb and my uh, my first two fingers. I'm just gently torquing it on down until I feel it bottom. Okay, there it is. It's bottomed out. So I'm going to go one. About two, about two and a half. That's about all I need right there. And like I said, we'll be doing some additional. Uh, it will either be backing it out or screwing it back in, depending on how the car is idling. Okay, let's get the other one in. The next thing we're going to do is get this dash pot put on, which was a uh, you know painted blue. Compliments of our good subscriber Ron C. Who sent me that can of Ford blue paint? Let's get it on. It doesn't it doesn't do anything. It just uh, I mean, there's nothing connected to it. It just screws on right here with this screw. And there's a little alignment pin on the uh, base that holds it. That holds it, you know, from screwing, you know, moving left and right. Let me hook it up and I'll show you what I'm talking about. What does the dash pot do? It's actually just a slow motion. It allows the uh, the gas pedal linkage to come back slowly. You know, let's say you're going down the road, you know, 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, and you come to a, a yield sign or an intersection. You let up in the gas. If you let up in the gas without a dash pot, your throttle would go, it would just go all the way down this way, cutting off the flow of gas quickly. And uh, keep in mind, your engine's still racing. And if, but your engine's, you know, revving up pretty high, and all of a sudden it loses its fuel, it, it'll stall on you because it's, it's, the fuel is not being fed at the proper level to keep the engine going. I mean, it just suddenly starves for fuel. So what this thing here does is it allows, it, it goes down, it allows the gas pedal to go down slowly, very slowly. There's a diaphragm in there. And then when you step on the gas and leave the intersection, whatever, it pops back out. And, and, and it enables the engine to slow down slowly, you know, come on, it, not real slow, but you know, it, it, the RPMs go down at a steady rate until it meets the level of the fuel that's coming in. That way you don't get a stall. It's kind of a cool idea actually. And uh, this, this thing here is tough to find actually. Brendan's the one that found it and he found it attached to that two barrel Autolite carburetor and he sent me the whole thing which was really cool. That's where this came from. And it looks a whole lot better now doesn't it? Let me see if there's anything else I need to do. We're still messing around with this automatic choke. Uh, this is the bottom of the piston, the whole, you know, the piston's up there. And we need to put this plug back in there, but, you know, it's going to fall out. So what I'm going to do is put a little JB Weld on both sides and just stick it in there, tap it on up in there until it covers the hole. Secondly, this uh, is where the old heat pipe used to connect. Fortunately, we have enough thread still left on it. Uh, not very many, but... They broke off when they tried to take them off. When they tried to take that heat pipe connector off, they wound up breaking them off, which is okay. You know, we're not using it anyway. But I'm going to go ahead and use this brass fitting. Uh, I found out it, it, it's for a, a quarter or a, uh, what is it, a quarter inch. Yeah, it's a quarter inch uh, copper line. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to screw that on up in here. If I can come up with some way, i got to find a flat washer of some kind, a flat piece of metal that'll drop down in there and just block that off. Not a big deal, I just don't want a bunch of crud and crap building up in there. Well, that was pretty easy. I just put a little dab and down in there in the ridge on one side and directly across from it, a little bit on the other side. Press it in with my thumb. Now I'll go ahead and tap it down with the screwdriver handle and that should pretty much take care of it. That thing is not going to go anywhere. Now, if I can just find something to block off this hole, uh, I need to look around and see what I can come up with. I think what I came up with will work. I put a nut on a very short screw, uh, putting the screw in the hole, 
and then trying to clamp this down on the top of it, it, it just wouldn't go on far enough to make contact with the screw head. So I beefed it up a little bit with a with a, a nut that went on there perfectly. Now all I gotta do is tighten this baby up. All right, let's go ahead and snug that baby up. I don't want any vibration or anything to make it fall down in the engine. It wouldn't do any damage or anything, but I think that's going to do it. The only thing I have left to do, actually, is I need to get some lock washers for these screws here and then tighten them all on down. I need eight of those. And uh, that's about it. So I think what I'm going to I'll stop off tomorrow, pick up the lock washers. I don't have any that size. You know, I've got all kinds of lock washers, and when you need them for something, you never have what you need. It never fails. I'm about ready to take this entire junk. i got several drawers of this stuff. It never does me any good. If I need three of something, there's only two. If I need two, there's only one. I save this junk year after year and never use it. Just drawer after drawer. I'm about ready to dump it all. Anyway, uh, I think that's it. I'm going to go ahead and discuss this with uh, my mentor, Brendan. Uh, there may be something that he used to do. He's an old stock car racer. He used to race stock cars years ago. And uh, But this baby here is, I mean, it, it's got plenty of room now on both sides to go back and forth. I'm real happy about that. And it works real well. So we'll go out and do one more thing and then we'll go ahead and wrap this video up and uh, then we're the next time let me see the next video I, I should have the coil spring cleaned and painted and we can go ahead and move right into the uh, calipers rebuild of the calipers or at least taking them apart and find out if I can uh, go ahead and rebuild them uh, I don't know what they look like underneath those pistons but we're all going to find out so let me go out and finish what I need to do to wrap up this video. We are going to put our undercoating on the inside of this fender well here. I wanted to get that done for this video. And that's going to be about it guys. I may put a few more dabs here and there but our inner fender well is done. One more thing I want to leave you with. You know all YouTubers they take their time, energy, money and effort to produce YouTube videos for people and that doesn't cost you a penny to watch. All you have to do is sit down, click a mouse, and sit back with a cup of coffee or a beer. And it, it, it's just free. Please keep that in mind. Get a couple more spots here. Until next time, this is John.